good morning again. Good morning to those of you joining us by way of video. Today, we're glad to have you with us. We have been now for a number of weeks on a particular road. This is, a, this is an exercise in repetition for those of you who have been here, as I'm attempting to really get this into your, your mind, your memory, your thoughts. We, as Christians, are on a road, right? Which road are we on? Yeah, we're on, the, we're on the road to Jerusalem because we're on the road to discipleship. We're on the road to discipleship, and in order to be a disciple of Jesus, we have to follow him to Jerusalem. So we've been saying we're on the road to discipleship that necessarily involves following him on the journey to Jerusalem. And why, again, Jerusalem? Not literally to Jerusalem, but for us. But for Jesus, Jesus had to go to Jerusalem because that's where the seat of power was. That's where all of the worldly power had come together and taken advantage of and misused the call of God and His people in the temple. Jesus had to go and confront that evil. Jesus had to go and offer himself as a sacrifice, the sacrifice, in order for all of us to not only, not only be forgiven our sins, but to have the opportunity to re-enter life with God. He had to make a way for us to come to God because we couldn't do that on our own. You may know, you may remember, those of you who have read or studied the, the Bible at all, if you've been a Christian for some time and you've been in, in church where, or, or wherever where you have had the opportunity to hear preaching and teaching on the Old Testament, you would know that when, when God called His people together, after He brought them out of slavery in Egypt and He called them together, He gave them the law. We call it the law and oftentimes we look at it with with disdain or with great thanks that we're no longer under the law, as, as some claim, because we've been saved by grace. But God gave the law at the time to help the people understand who He is and how to live accordingly. The law reflected His character, and all of the different components of the law in the Old Testament teach about who God is. And for those who want to be associated with Him, those who want to be called His children, that's the way He expects us to live. And so it was given as a gift initially. It was given as a means of revealing who God's character is and calling His people to stand out among all the other behaviors of the people around Him. This was a blessing. It was a good thing. And in a key passage for us to remember is we're trying to to get into our minds certain things that will help us remember who we are as Christians. Certain passages maybe from the, from the Bible that will help us focus and, and zero in on the, the key teachings of God would be in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now if you're not familiar with Deuteronomy, let me encourage you to find time to read Deuteronomy. And you say, read, why in the world would I want to read that? It's old news, it's old history. And it's a lot of outdated practices, things we don't do anymore. Granted, but there's a lot of things in Deuteronomy that very much apply to us. And frankly, if you are a student of the New Testament, if you're one of those who wants to really understand what Jesus taught and why he taught it, you're going to miss out unless you understand what God was doing with his first people and what he was teaching through the great prophet and teacher and leader, Moses. Moses wrote Deuteronomy, and it contains kind of a repetition of the Ten Commandments. We think of the Ten Commandments being in Exodus, and you'll find them there in Exodus chapter 20, but also you'll find them in Deuteronomy in chapter 5. And I encourage you to get familiar with the book of Deuteronomy. But in chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, really good to remember really good to memorize, frankly. The teaching is known as the Shema in Hebrew. What is the Shema? Anybody know? What does Shema stand for? What does Shema mean? 
What it means literally is listen. It's God calling us to listen. What is the Shema? It is God's teaching all rolled up in one. It's captured for us. As you might read when you're studying the Ten Commandments, the first and, and part of the second commandment all tied in together. It was critical for God's people to understand this teaching. We're going to come back to Deuteronomy, but I want to highlight it to you this morning because I really, I really want us to get that the New Testament is so much richer when we study the Old Testament and we gain all that God had been doing, the knowledge of all that God had been doing, walking with His people through, through the centuries. We have been studying here in these last weeks Jesus' march or His journey to Jerusalem. And we've been following along with the disciples as we ourselves have been trying to, to remind us of God's call on our lives as disciples. What does it mean to be a disciple? What better way to do that than follow along with those original disciples as they were learning? So we've been using the Gospel of Mark to do that. And in particular, you know, we spent a number of weeks on Mark chapters 8, 9, and 10 contained a rich uh, amount of teaching from Jesus on how to be a follower, how to be a disciple. This morning, we're in chapter 12. So if you have your Bible... I invite you to turn there, whether it's in hard copy or on, on your, one of your devices, chapter 12, to a very familiar passage, beginning Mark 12, verse 28. This teaching, in these next few verses, you find not only in Mark, but you can find them in Matthew, and you can find them in Luke. And you find them in the Deuteronomy passage that I mentioned. Jesus here quotes the Shema. Well, let me back up just a minute and give you a little bit of, of context. Jesus, as you know, is on the way to Jerusalem to encounter the powers that be, to correct the incorrect use of God's temple, to try to teach the true followers of God what it means to have this is our God and what that looks like when we live it out. And so he's been teaching them, and as you might imagine, if he's going to counter the, the forces at that time that had taken the wrong way, the wrong approach to being God's people, he would run into an encounter with them. And in the passage just before ours, the Sadducees, some of those religious leaders who had different views and had misused the power that God had given them, they have come to Jesus and they've been questioning now, you've got to remember that the Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection at all. And so they're trying to trick him by making up this scenario uh, involving a man who died. And, and the law at the time was if a man, a married man, died and he left no children, then someone had to take care of his widow. And if he had brothers, the brother was expected to marry the widow and produce children. Well, they go through this long litany of a, a man had seven brothers, and each of them marries and then dies successively, and nobody leaves children. And so they say, those who didn't believe in the resurrection at all, Lord, or teacher, or rabbi, Jesus, they, when, when these all are in the resurrection, when they're all raised from the dead, who will be married? I don't mean to spend a lot of time on that, but I want you to have the context. There's a debate going on. These religious leaders, these Sadducees, are are questioning Jesus, trying to trick him or trap him. And so they're arguing over this, they're debating, and in that context, our passage begins. A teacher of the law comes upon them, and he hears the, them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, not getting caught up in their treachery. He asks, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Here again, we go back to the passage in Deuteronomy where Jesus now quotes it. The most important one, he answered, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In other words, there's just one God. There may be a lot of gods in our way of talking today with a little G, you know, a lot of gods that other peoples worship. 
Today we might talk about idols. Today we might talk about people who believe in, in other religions or don't have any faith in particular in any God. But something controls their life. <coughs> Maybe they chase after money. Maybe they ch chase after fame. Maybe they want to be wildly popular or have a lot of political influence, a lot of power. Now, I'm not saying that anybody that has any of those things is bad. Those things aren't bad in themselves, but if we allow them to become our God, if we allow them to become an idol in our lives, meaning we give them a priority over the God of ancient Israel, the God and Father of Jesus Christ, then we have put ourselves in place for judgment. We've put ourselves in place of God's wrath. And so the people of Israel all the way up through Jesus' time held on to this teaching. If you're going to be my people, God said, the first thing you have to do is understand that I am the only God. You're to worship me only, he says. What does worship look like? Love. Not as an emotion, right? Love can be an emotion. We talk about loving people as an emotion. But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about love as a commitment. He's talking about love and caring for the well-being and benefit of another. And so in this passage, Jesus follows up in his answer by saying, The Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. In other words, with everything that you are. With everything that you are. All the, all the, the gifts you have, all the skills you have, all the talents you have. Bless Him in the decisions that you make. Use the possessions, the money, the earning power, your job. Use your relationships. Everything you are, everything you're about is to be an act of worship to God. And the best way to worship God, the only true way to worship God is to love Him by following His commands. And then in quoting from Leviticus, love your neighbors. In other words, love those that you're around. Love other people. Now, he doesn't call us to love them instead of ourselves, but he calls us to love them as we love ourselves. If you're a Christian, this is hopefully old news to you. Hopefully this is redundant teaching. You've heard this over and over. If you're not a Christian, maybe this is the first time you're hearing this. Whether you are or are not a Christian, this is the true word of God. This is who he is and what he calls us to follow. And it's vitally important that if we're to be a follower of God, that we get this. Now, it's more than just getting it, right? You can hear it. I'm supposed to love God with all that I am. And let's take the high road for a minute. Let's assume that each of us wants to love God. Well, we have to know who He is to love Him. It's hard to love somebody you don't know. It's not impossible but it's a lot easier when you know them and you know their needs to care for them and to bless them and to love them. So he wants us to know him, but he also wants us to love each other. You may remember that one of the ways Jesus taught, taught his disciples about being recognized as belonging to him, if you love each other, they will know you're my disciple, right? They will know you're mine. They will know you follow me if you love each other. Because let's face it, that's not a common thing for us to do, and it's certainly not inherent in us unless we're following God. Now that doesn't mean that people who don't follow God have no love at all. Everyone, the scripture says, is made in the image of God. Everyone has some ability to love. But if you're going to love somebody else like you love yourself, it's going to require you to sacrifice some things that you would do for you in order to do for somebody else. 
If you're caught up in just loving yourself, which is far too easy to do, if you're caught up in only trying to gain advances for yourself, get ahead, then there's not going to be time for anybody else. And so Jesus is challenging us to make time, make room in our agenda, make room in our value system for loving others. And that only by doing that will we stand out and be recognized as His disciples. It's pretty amazing teaching, really. When you stop and think of all the things God has asked us to do, all the different ways He's asked us to live our lives, found all throughout Scripture, all the things that we might say are good morals that make you a good person, you know? We talk about, that's a good guy, or that's a good woman. All of those things rolled up together mean nothing unless we love each other. And loving each other is truly using what you have to bless them. Your time, your talents, your money, your possessions. Again, this may be old news, but it's never irrelevant news. Because to be an American today, living in arguably the greatest country of luxury of all times, the greatest country of power, the greatest country of, of power in, in economic terms, in educational terms, in resources, and on and on and on. We well understand the opportunity we have to get ahead. We well understand the temptation to use what we have to get ahead. Do we remember that even as an American, if we are Christian, our first calling is not to pursue life, liberty, and happiness, prosperity. Our first calling as a Christian is to love God and love others. Jesus is answering this even to a teacher of the law several thousand years ago. He's saying the first, the greatest, the most important commandment of God is to love God with all that you are. And the second is just like it. Love each other. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's fascinating that this teacher, who you might expect in just a first reading of this, knowing he's a teacher of the law on the way typically teachers of the law run into trouble with Jesus. This teacher of the law says, well said, teacher. You're right in saying that God is one and there's no other but Him. To love Him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. That may not mean much to you and me today because we don't do burnt offerings and sacrifices, right? But in that day and age, and particularly in the context in which this conversation is even occurring, they're in the temple. They're in the very place where sacrifices were being done. You could probably smell the burning flesh from the sacrifices as Jesus and this teacher are having this discussion. And in fact, this teacher of the law is only a teacher of the law has power and authority only because of the temple that he's standing in. It's only because of the power that had become associated with the temple cult. Those leaders who were associated, who had been educated and were given positions of been carrying out what was important in the temple. That's how he had his authority. So, in other words, you've got a key leader standing in the place of his greatest power and authority, acknowledging that the key activity that goes on in the temple, sacrifices and offerings as forgiveness for sin, are not the primary thing that God desires. 
It's an amazing admission. It would be like a... Man, I'm going to stretch a minute. I'm going to call you to stretch a minute. It'd be like a politician today. Don't think bad things. It'd be like a politician today. Let's say a good politician. Let's say one who's honorable and really wants to lead. Nevertheless is dependent upon our votes, right? Standing in the midst of an election in a place like the Capitol and saying it is critically important that you understand that more than voting for me, you vote for the right leader. The leader who will lead you in doing what is right even if it isn't me and even if it isn't my party. Are you getting how radically different this is? I mean, who says that, right? When's the last time you heard a leader of any stripe stand up and say that? And I don't mean to just pick on politicians. Pick a leader in any institution you want to. Quite frankly, how many pastors do you hear stand up and say, let me tell you what's most important. What's most important is that you worship God and that you come to understand who He is. And if you can find better teaching and a pastor who will lead you more faithfully to be a disciple of God outside of this church, then go there. That's what we pastors typically do, don't we? We typically hold up, you know, sheets, got all the names of pastors of other churches and say, hey, if these are better, you go there. I bring that up not to bash pastors anymore that I'm bashing politicians. I'm bringing it up to make a point, and you know what that point is. What does it mean to value truth more than your own advancement? What does it mean to value the Word of God taught by His Son more than you value your own ideas, principles, values that may get you ahead? This is who we're called to be as disciples. We are called to pursue what is right and what is true. Period. And in a culture that doesn't always support Christian values, that can be a challenge for us. It can be a particular challenge when there is in every one of us if not said out loud, the thoughts that go through our minds that criticize, that say, well, you shouldn't be that way. I'm not saying that we don't have reason to know the difference in right and wrong. What I'm saying is that what Jesus is teaching here, that God had taught all the way from the beginning with His people, is that we are to love God above everything else. And I would present to you today the argument that all of us are tempted to get caught up in criticizing others and their views and their values and their ways and maybe their politics far too easily. And we spend a lot less time focusing on how I can love God and love others, all others, more. Well said, teacher, you are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but Him. I wonder what non-Christians think of me. They have the privilege, if you call it that, of going on to our website or going on to YouTube and finding us and hearing a sermon from me every Sunday. And for those that live around me in the neighborhood or out of the community that know me, what do they know of me? Do they see this principle, this teaching lived out? I'm not hidden from public view. Would a non-follower of Jesus say, I don't believe in his God, and I don't hold the same values he does. 
But I can tell you, that guy loves people. And he loves God. And he uses his life to demonstrate that. Would they say that about me? Would they say it about you? Is that your reputation? Are you known by the people who know you? Not just friends, not just family. But the people who know you well, that watch you from a distance. Would they readily identify you as a follower of Jesus? Because you're constantly loving other people and working for their benefit. This is the call on our lives. And every time you and I say, even if it's just in our minds, something critical about what goes on in our country, something critical about what goes on in our neighborhood or our city or our state, Every time we say something critical or think something critical about somebody else and the way they're doing things now and what has happened to us, every time we do that, we're building our reputation. Are we building our reputation by tearing down others and complaining? Are we building our reputation is a follower of Jesus, one who loves God with everything we are and everything we have. It's an incredible invitation. It's an incredible challenge. Right? Who of us loves in such a way? Jesus answered this teacher of the law. And he answers us if we get this. If we were to answer this same thing, what do we, what do we consider the most important teaching of God? That I'm to love him with everything I am. Everything. He is to be first every moment of every day. He's to be the thing that I think of when I'm waking up. He's to be the thing, the, the person that I'm most in, involved in pleasing. He's the one that I'm supposed to be knowing better than anybody else and his way of living better than anybody else and following him. So if he asked me, read, what is the most important commandment? What's the most important teaching that I have given you? And I said, it's to love you, Lord, with everything that I am and everything that I have. And to love my neighbors, to love others like I love me. What would he say? To a teacher of the law who we have no indication that he's bad. He said, you're not far from the kingdom of God. Meaning you're getting close. Don't misunderstand. This is not a call to earn your way in. We can only do that by the saving grace of Jesus. But remember that God's grace was given to us in order to do this. Let that sink in. What is the most important teaching of God to you? Here it is. Love God with everything that you are and love your neighbors as yourself. Only then will we be known as a true follower of Jesus. Will you pray with me? And those of you at home, pray with me as well. Lord, this is such a simple teaching. And you have given it to us repeatedly. 
in very simple and clear terms. We are to love you with all that we are and all that we have. And we're to love each other like we love ourselves. How many of the things we dislike and disagree and complain and carry on about would be eliminated, would just go away if we loved. If that was our first agenda. Lord, you know us. You know our selfishness. You know our self-centeredness. You know our temptation and how quickly we run to, to my right. The things that I deserve. My rights and my, my needs. To be treated fairly and to be honored. To be given whatever. And how quickly... I am to criticize when I don't get in my way. Lord, I can't do this without you. But by your great grace and mercy, I don't have to. Because you have given me your word to teach me and your spirit to empower me. You have given me your spirit to enable me to do the impossible but that is made possible by your presence. Lord, will you teach us? Will you remind us? Will you continue to call us to be people of the way? People of the truth. People who live the real life of loving working for the benefit of others making our love for you first in our life not just in our beliefs but in my activities of the day in my goals and in my activities in my words and my thoughts in my aspirations and the things that I strive for am I thinking of loving you loving others it has to start here help us God help us to be more faithful in this that those that don't know you will be blessed in your name by us enough that they may give you another try come to see you for who you really are. May we honor your name by the way we love, Lord.